Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 7 of West's Respiratory Physiology textbook. In this chapter, we're going over the mechanics of breathing. It is the largest chapter of this textbook, so bear with us as we go through the main key points here, trying to be as succinct as possible. We go over the muscles of respiration, we go over some important concepts like compliance of the lungs, and then we talk about some diseases as well. So mechanics of breathing just is going to describe the forces that move the lung and chest wall and the resistance that they overcome. Let's talk about inspiration first. This is the act of breathing in. The major muscle that does this is the diaphragm. The diaphragm gets contracted, it pushes down, and then it increases the vertical dimension of the chest cavity, creating that negative pressure to suck air into the lungs. You do have some intercostal muscles, those muscles in between your ribs that do act to help to move the chest wall up and forward during inspiration. And specifically, it is the external intercostal muscles that do that. The internal intercostals work for expiration. So just remember your external intercostal muscles help with inspiration just think when you breathe in your chest moves up and forward as well but once again your diaphragm is your major inspiratory muscle if your diaphragm is paralyzed that means you get this paradoxical movement where as negative pressure increases within the lungs your diaphragm gets pushed out and you get this paradoxical movement as your diaphragm moves into your lung cavity and gets pushed out of the abdominal cavity. It's effectively getting sucked up when it is being paralyzed. So diaphragm for inspiration along with external intercostals and then some accessory muscles of inspiration, including the scalene muscles, which elevate the first two ribs, and the sternocleidomastoids muscle, which raises the sternum. Most of which, these accessory ones are more forced inspiration, trying to take in a big gulp of air. Next is expiration. This is a very passive motion. So inspiration is active. You contract all these muscles to move your chest wall out, increase that negative pressure and suck air into the lungs. All of the energy used to bring that chest cavity up and out and also down gets stored and then released as elastic energy to then help that chest and diaphragm relax and bring everything down, pushing out all the air within your lungs. So expiration is passive, at least quiet expiration is, but it becomes active during exercise and hyperventilation. Your important muscles here include your internal intercostal muscle that pulls the ribs downwards and inwards. You also have your abdominal wall muscles, so your rectus abdominis, your internal and external oblique muscles, and the transverse abdominis. So expiration, passive, if it's going to be active, you're involving your abdominal muscles and the internal intercostal muscles. Speaking of elastic properties of the lung and chest wall, that brings us to this pressure volume loop. This shows us pressure on the x-axis getting progressively more negative, so lowering down, and then volume on the y-axis. What you can see is that we have inspiration, which has a more sigmoid curve, and then expiration, which has a more gradual reduction curve. So there is a difference in the pressure for a given volume with inspiration and expiration. That is called hysteresis. The other thing to note is that even at end expiration, you still have some volume within your lungs. And that's that gas trapped in your alveoli. If you try to even breathe that out even further, you're gonna collapse your small bronchioles and, and actually collapse them so then air can't get through. So you've got this minimal volume within your lungs, inspiration, there is an increase in pressure without much of an increase in volume initially that's overcome. We have that increased volume with increased pressure, which then plateaus out. This plateau at the top here is essentially because there are some physical limitations to your lung. They can only be so inflated within your chest cavity. So it doesn't matter how much pressure you generate at a certain point, you can't increase the volume even more. So that's why you have that plateau at the top here. As you expire, 
there is a gradual reduction in volume initially that steadily increases with a rising pressure or less negative pressure. The pressure that we're talking about is called the transpulmonary pressure. That is the difference between the pressure in the inside and the outside of the lung. Compliance is a very important term. Just know this equation. Compliance is just V over P or volume over pressure. More specifically, it is the change in volume for a change in pressure. So how much is the lungs going to increase in volume for a given change in pressure? Like we had mentioned back on this other diagram over here, compliance is significantly reduced at this portion of the curve. You cannot increase your volume despite increasing your pressure or changing your pressure because of that dramatically reduced compliance once you have a completely filled lungs. But during the steeper portion, this is where compliance is optimal. You have a rapid change in volume with a change in pressure. So that is essentially compliance. You can get a reduction in compliance with specific diseases, so like pulmonary fibrosis or alveolar edema, which prevents a change in volume with a change in pressure. That means ventilation is obviously going to be reduced in those regions. They have this quick question here of what is responsible for the lung's elastic behavior. The big thing is the elastic tissue, so the fibers of elastin and collagen, and more importantly is their geometric ar arrangement. So they're arranged in a way that allows them to, that allows the structure to be stretched, not necessarily all the fibers individually being stretched, but the structure to be stretched, conserve that energy, and then once it's allowed to release that energy as that pressure is reduced, it can just naturally shrink down. The next important topic is surface tension. Surface tension is the pressure or the attraction of water molecules or liquid molecules to be attached to one another. The example is a soap bubble. So a soap bubble is obviously you've got your liquid soap that has air within it. The reason why it's that shape is because all of that liquid is trying to touch each other. They're all attracted to one another. So they will reduce down to the point where they're as close as possible, where the pressure within the bubble overcomes their attractive forces. That is very similar to what's happening within your alveoli. The alveoli liquid within it is, they're all attracted to one another. So they wanna be attracted to one another and keep that alveoli quite small. So it requires more pressure and more energy to expand the alveoli and break open those attractive forces. The larger the alveoli, the more spread out those molecules are and the weaker those attractive forces are trying to force that bubble down into a smaller diameter. So during inspiration, you have to overcome that surface tension. The body has this very neat way of being able to overcome that surface tension using something called surfactant. Surfactant is produced by type 2 alveolar cells. Just as a reminder, type 1 are the ones that participate in gas exchange, or I should say they are that lining that helps to keep the wall of the alveoli really, really thin. Type 2 cells, however, are different shaped, and they produce the surfactant. Surfactant is a phospholipid made out of dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine, or DPPC. This molecule effectively gets into all those water molecules, breaks them up, and breaks up all of those attractive forces trying to force that alveoli into a smaller and smaller chamber. So you reduce that energy or that pressure required to expand the alveoli. So surfactant, very important for reducing surface tension and allowing the alveoli to expand. It does not get produced until you're very close to birth as a baby or a fetus. So preterm babies do have an issue of maybe not producing enough surfactant. So then that lungs are effectively collapsed because they cannot overcome that surface tension and they require treatments with inhaled surfactant to help reduce that surface tension so then the lungs can then expand. It does mention Laplace's law. This is another equation to know. This describes that surface tension that we're talking about, how the pressure that is generated within, let's say, that bubble molecule is going to be equal to four times the surface tension, that tension that is that attractive force bringing all those molecules together, divided by the radius of the bubble. So the bigger the bubble, the less pressure within the bubble. The greater the surface tension, then the greater the pressure within the bubble itself. And we can just equivalent that bubble to our alveoli. So how does surfactant actually work? 
So once again, it's able to break up those attractive forces, but it's able to do that by having a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end that aligns themselves in the surface. So then there's actually a repulsive force pushing away all of these molecules, counteracting all of those attractive forces. So once again, that reduces surface tension, increases compliance of the lungs, reduces the work to expand the lungs with each breath, and also helps to stabilize that alveoli because you've reduced that collapsing force. It is also able to keep the alveoli dry because that surface tension that's within the alveoli, let's say without surfactant, actually helps to suck in water from the tissues as well. So you're going to suck water into the alveoli because of those that surface tension and those attractive forces. So by surfactant getting in there, breaking up those attractive forces, you reduce that tendency for water to be sucked into the alveoli. Without surfactant, once again, stiff lungs, collapsed lungs, respiratory distress syndrome in the neonate, not particularly compatible with the life. They also cover this concept of interdependence. This is the fact that alveoli, they're not just solitary beings. They are attached to groupings, almost like grapes on a grapevine. So if you have one alveoli that's trying to expand too far, it's actually going to have tension from all the other grapes or the other alveoli, preventing it from expanding too much. Same with an alveoli that's trying to collapse. The other more inflated alveoli near it is going to almost prop it up and keep it from collapsing. So that feature is called interdependence. We then touch on regional differences in ventilation again. So we talked about this in the VQ mismatch chapter. We'll only briefly go over it here. The intrapleural pressure is less negative at the bottom of the lung, the base of the lung. So that means that we have a greater ventilation because the lungs are a lot easier to inflate. We are operating over here on our pressure volume curve here, where we're operating more down the bottom here where we have a greater compliance, whereas the apex of the lungs is operating more at the more plateau region of the lungs. Yes, there may be proportionally more volume in the apex, but that volume is not moving much because of that reduced compliance. So the base of the heart is operating at this intrapleural pressure that's less negative, but that means that it's operating on the steeper part of the curve with a small reduction in intrapleural pressure, you get a greater change in volume. So better compliance at the base of the lungs, meaning that we have greater ventilation. We already talked about that previously. Remember, blood flow is also greater at the base of the lungs. It does also briefly touch on the concept here of the fact that you have a lower volume within the lungs, that means you have a greater compliance, as we had mentioned with the base of the lungs. So if you have an extremely high lung volume, you've already stretched yourself out too thin and your compliance is reduced. Now you can have an issue where you have an extremely low lung volume where the base of the heart is now operating right at the bottom of the plateau here, whereas the apex of the lungs is now on that steeper portion. So your apex is a greater compliance and that's functioning normally. But now the base of the lungs actually has a positive intrapleural pressure. That means that those lungs are effectively collapsed. And now our distribution of ventilation is inverted where the upper regions are ventilating better than your lower regions. That kind of brings us over to airway closure where that positive pressure, or at least those collapsed lungs, they're pressing down, collapsing those small bronchioles and trapping gas within the distal alveoli. This occurs only at extremely low lung volumes in healthy patients, but elderly people, they can actually have airway closure just purely because of having naturally stiffer lungs when you're older. You can have airway closure when you're older at higher lung volumes because of that loss of elastic recoil. It does mention the elastic properties of the chest wall. The main thing here is the lungs are getting pulled outward, but the chest wall is actually getting pulled inward. If you were to make a stab into the chest and allow air into the chest, you will notice that the chest actually pops open because it's being naturally sucked inwards with that intrapleural pressure or that transpulmonary pressure. So the chest wall has, is being sucked in, the lungs are being sucked out, and that helps to create that negative transpulmonary pressure. And the chest wall contributes to that natural elastic recoil in the lungs. 
there's a tiny bit of extra information in terms of our compliance of our chest wall and our lungs and how they mesh together. But that's effectively the main thing you need to know. The chest wall also has an elastic property getting pulled in. Airway resistance is next. So this is flow through a tube. This may be blood, this could be air. Whatever you're talking about, flow of a substance through a tube has very similar properties. It may be lamina, where all of the air is flowing in nice stream-like fashion. The middle of the tube is going to travel faster because it's not overcoming the resistive forces or being slid against the side of the tube. Whereas turbulent airflow means that you have all these eddy currents. So the air is not in a nice stream-like fashion, it's just constantly spiraling. We have a tendency for eddy currents to form or turbulent airflow to form either because you have a branching point so that laminar airflow hits the branching point and turns into an eddy current or if you have a high Reynolds number. We will touch on Reynolds number in a second here. But first, talking back on laminar flow, this can be described by Poisson's law who was a French physician. He has shown that flow through that tube is going to be proportional to this equation here, which is pressure times pi r to the power of four divided by eight times the viscosity of the flow times the length of the tube. The important factor here is the r4. So this is extremely important because you have a dramatic increase in flow with a small increase in radius. So you slightly increase the radius of the tube, that means you dramatically increase the flow of air through that tube or if you're talking about blood, dramatically increase flow of blood through that tube. The great example there is peripheral catheters. If you use a very small catheter gauge, that's going to have some serious flow limitations. Whereas if you use a larger gauge, you have very little flow limitations because of this R to the power of four. Now you can rearrange this equation because of Ohm's law, taking into account resistance and pressure and flow. Really, you can rearrange it so then Poisson's law can represent resistance as being proportional to 8 times the viscosity times the length divided by pi r to the power of 4. Once again, you increase the radius by a power of 4, you dramatically reduce the resistance. So if you reduce the radius slightly, you dramatically increase the resistance which is going to subsequently reduce the flow. So that is characterizing laminar flow. Turbulent flow is more described by this equation here, P equals K times V squared. So the pressure, instead of being proportional to flow rate, it's got some slightly different properties now. So we have to use a slightly different equation. Now, turbulent blood flow, once again, is going to be created once you have a high Reynolds number. A high Reynolds number equals a number greater than 2000. The equation for the Reynolds number is here. So two times the velocity times the radius times the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity. So if you increase your density, increase your velocity, increase your radius of your tube, you're going to increase Reynolds number and make turbulent blood flow more likely. When this relates to airflow in your bronchial tree, it is way too complicated to try to simplify it down like that. There are so many branching points, however, that you're going to have some eddy currents and laminar airflow is just not really occurring. Where do you have the maximum resistance though? You may think it's the smallest little bronchioles because they have the smallest radius. Interestingly, all those branching points actually helps to reduce the resistance. You're just adding all these little extra circuits to the system. So you actually have the highest resistance occurs more upstream within the bronchial tree. And we'll touch on that later on in this chapter as well. So how about the pressures within our breathing cycle? That can be summarized in this figure 7.13 here. With inspiration, we're obviously increasing volume. In order to increase the volume and inflate the lungs, you need to reduce your intrapleural pressure to suck that air in. That means that your flow is going to increase and your alveolar pressure also has to become negative to suck the air into the alveoli. Now this reduction in alveolar pressure helps to contribute to the reduction in intrapleural pressure as noted by this dashed line here. So the dashed line is without the alveolar pressure being reduced, being accounted for, 
So you actually have this solid line. Same with expiration, where we have a reduction in volume, an increase in alveolar pressure as well, in addition to that increased flow as air leaves the lungs. So I teased you a little bit about where resistance is greatest within the bronchial tree and said it's further upstream from your terminal bronchioles. It is right at your segmental bronchi. So you can see that resistance on the side here increases and then dramatically reduces as you get to your bronchi region. So once you're in your terminal bronchioles, there is very little resistance. So the highest amount of resistance is right at that segmental bronchi or those medium sized bronchi. And effectively that's because you have so many tiny little bronchioles that all of those extra circuits are helping to reduce the resistance. So this is an important point. You may be asked, where is airway resistance the greatest in the bronchial tree? It is your medium sized bronchi. Airway resistance often tends to be reduced with a greater lung volume. So if you have more air within your lung, airway resistance is going to be lower. You have maximally dilated all your bronchi, bronchioles, etc. Increase that radius, reduce the resistance. So people who have naturally obstructive or increased airway resistance type diseases, they often operate and breathe at naturally higher lung volumes to try to reduce that higher airway resistance. That airway resistance is often contributed by the bronchial smooth muscle that contracts and reduces your airway diameter. So this is going to occur if you have some stimulation of your receptors in your trachea or large bronchi from various irritants and that motor innervation is gonna be the vagus nerve. So your parasympathetic supply causing bronchoconstriction. The treatment is beta-2 agonists. Remember, your beta receptors are a part of your sympathetic nervous system. In general, beta-2 receptors are going to cause dilation wherever they are. On the bronchioles, that means you're going to cause dilation of your bronchioles. So beta-2 agonists are the treatment to help increase the diameter of your bronchioles. Now this flow volume curve is what we're gonna talk about next, and this is a fun little topic here. So this is showing us flow on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis. And the A curve, this one that goes up and then steadily goes down, is representing a maximum inspiration with forced expiration. So with forced expiration, you have a reduction in volume over time. Now, the very interesting point made here is that if you just take a smaller breath and then do a forced expiration, the total volume entering the lungs is lower, but you rejoin the same line from your maximum inspiration in terms of expiratory flow. So you can't breathe out any faster or slower despite how much you breathe in initially. And then B is showing us when you have a very small inspiration and then expiration that's initially slow. So you breathe out some volume, but then you force it out. You're going to actually have a rejoining to this line again. So what this is trying to tell you is that with forced expiration, you cannot increase or decrease how fast you can get air out of your lungs. That is really the main point here is that you cannot get air out of your lungs any faster or slower when you're forcing it out. And the whole reason behind that is because you start to constrict your small bronchioles. So you create a resistance point that it doesn't matter how much pressure you're generating within your alveoli, you're going to have that resistance point that's limiting flow out your mouth. So the collapse of your small bronchioles creates a stable resistance. The greater that you're forcing out, the more that's going to constrict down and restrict your airflow. So expiration, when it's forced, you have a stable flow that is independent of your effort, all due to dynamic compression of your airways. That leads us into the forced expiration test. This is when you do effectively the same thing, but you are just trying to breathe out as rapidly as possible. And then you have these values here. You got the first forced expiratory volume after one second. So just the volume that was exhaled within the first second, how much volume was actually exhaled and then the forced vital capacity so that's right at the end of the plateau so how much volume you were able to get out in total and then we have this equation of forced expiratory volume after one second divided by 
the vital capacity. Normal is going to be 80%. So you get out 80% of your air within the first second of expiration. With obstructive disease, it's extremely hard to force that air out. So there's an extremely slow plateau as volume is slowly leaving your lungs. That means that the ratio between the one second expiratory volume and the vital capacity is going to be reduced as seen in this diagram here. So this means that with obstructive diseases, that's going to be a ratio of 42%. Restrictive disease on the other end, where it's harder to breathe in, you're going to actually have a larger lung volume. So resistance to expiration is actually going to be lower. So you're able to breathe out pretty rapidly, meaning that our ratio is going to be increased at 90%. The difference between obstructive and restrictive disease is restrictive is a struggling to inhale and expand your lungs due to let's say pulmonary fibrosis obstructive disease is an issue trying to squeeze the air out and that's diseases such as copid or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or bronchial asthma it then touches on some additional causes of uneven ventilation and this is touching on the individual alveolar level so it shows us three scenarios here you've got the normal scenario where you have inspiration and an increase in volume We've got B, where you've got reduced compliance. That means that you have initial increase in volume quite rapidly, but due to that reduced compliance, at a given point, it doesn't matter how much pressure changes, you can no longer get any more volume within your lungs. So you've got this early plateau. And then the last example, C here, is increased resistance. So it takes forever for air to get into that space, meaning that the volume only gradually increases. So if you've got these regional areas which have reduced compliance or maybe an obstruction to some of your alveoli, that's going to result in reduced ventilation in some particular regions. It touches on tissue resistance, which is just those viscous forces that need to be overcome in order to expand the chest using the pressure volume loop over here. With inspiration, you can see this line for A, B, C. The hatched region is going to represent your internal work. So that is the work required to overcome the viscous elements or the viscous resistances within the airway and the tissue. Whereas the area under this curve, so this flat line D, C, E, A, this is going to represent your external work. So this is the work required to overcome your elastic forces. Your elastic forces are once again, if you have an elastic band, let's say, it's not automatically ready to snap closed. It requires some energy put into it to stretch it apart and allow it to then snap back. So those elastic forces is just pulling a rubber band and that represents this external work over here. We then obviously have expiration, and then the region within A, F, C, and E, this region right here that I will self-hatch right here, this represents the energy saved because of those elastic forces that snapped back. So that stored energy being put into work. There are some estimations for the total work of breathing and the efficiency required to ventilate your lungs. Effectively, this is saying how much energy and oxygen does it take to actually breathe in oxygen in the first place. Clearly, if it took more oxygen and more energy in order to get oxygen into your bloodstream, then the whole system would be completely useless because you don't have any energy left to provide to the rest of the body. Clearly, that's an extreme example. The efficiency of the lung is around 5 to 10 percent so really it takes about 5 percent of the oxygen for ventilation to occur so of all your total body oxygen consumption five percent of it is for ventilation people with obstructive lung diseases however that can dramatically increase up to let's say 30 percent which means that if you're trying to do any more additional oxygen consumptive like work so exercise for example you may not be able to do as much because so much of that energy is required just to breathe positive pressure ventilation is just the action of using a ventilator to force oxygen into the lungs so instead of the lungs getting more negative in pressure and sucking air in instead you obviously have an endotracheal tube in and you're going to 
push the air into the lungs. So that's positive pressure ventilation. You're using positive pressure to force all of that air into the lungs. It still has some complex principles like compliance, airway resistance, regional differences, etc. But it's beyond the scope of this textbook and will be covered in much more complicated textbooks. Otherwise, that brings us to the end of the chapter. Here are the key concepts, a clinical scenario, the questions. Once again, the answers to these questions will be provided within the description. Otherwise, feel free to drop a comment. I hope you enjoyed this chapter and we'll see you in the next one.